Thank you, sir. Good evening and warm greetings from India, Chennai Center for China Studies and National Maritime Foundation. Great to meet you all in another C3S NMF book discussion. Our today's discussion is on the book China as a 21st century naval power theory, practice, and implications with the author, Rear Admiral Michael McDevitt, formerly US Navy and senior fellow, the Center for Naval Analysis. To introduce a topic, Xi Jinping has made his ambitions for the People's Liberation Army perfectly clear. There is no mystery what he means. First, he wants China should become a great maritime power. And secondly, he wants the PLA to become a world-class armed force by 2050. China's stated maritime policy under President Xi Jinping has contained these notable elements. The first is the goal of building China into a maritime great power, which appeared for the first time in the CCP's most authoritative political document, the Political Work Report at the 18th Party Congress in 2012. And it was also reaffirmed again at the 19th Party Congress in 2017. China's 2019 Defense White Paper further outlined the need to build a strong and modernized naval force that is capable of carrying out missions on the far seas. This goal was in fact put, for, put forward by Zhang Zemin at the two meetings back in 2000. Zhang Zemin stated that constructing a maritime great power is an important historic task for which we must earnestly conduct research. What has really changed in China's maritime policy since Xi Jinping took power? How is this to be compared with China's policy direction over the preceding years? And what is the likely future scenarios? Today, a broad themes of today's discussion are also on the current and future capabilities of the plan in the Indo-Pacific. It is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker of the day and author of the book, Rear Admiral Michael McDevitt. During his 34-year distinguished naval career, Rear Admiral had four appointments at sea commands, including an aircraft carrier battle group. He began a 30-year involvement with US security policy and strategy in Asia when he was assigned to the Office of Secretary of Defense in 1990 as director, and then as acting deputy assistant secretary of defense for East Asia. He served as a congressionally appointed commissioner on the US-China Economic and Security and Review Commission between 2017-2019. The present book of discussion, China Has 21st Century Naval Power, was published by the US Naval Institute Press. He is a graduate of the University of Southern California and Georgetown University, where he focused on US East Asian diplomatic history. Thank you for joining us, sir, and a pleasure having you with us. With these words, I now request Commodore Aras Vasan, Director General C3S and Regional Director, National Maritime Foundation, to kindly deliver the opening address. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Bala. I think you already set the tone for discussions today. First of all, I deem it a great honor and privilege to welcome Admiral Bektavit. I know because uh, we have uh, some of the naval officers here, and we always look up to the, the kind of credentials that the Admiral has, uh, not just in the naval service, but also after retirement, where he's been an active participant in CNA discussions. The Center for Naval Analysis, or at least the naval officers here are very familiar with the CNA. You know, you look at those podcasts, you look at the kind of analysis that they do under the six headings that they have. So, you know, we are very, very pleased, Admiral, that uh, you uh, accepted our invitation to here to discuss your book. Of course, uh, your book is very clear about what it wants to uh, bring out in terms of the policy, in terms of the practices, and in terms of the theory that's being followed by uh, the PLA Navy. And uh, as uh, Bala also uh, brought our attention to the defense white paper of China 2019, I think they have not uh, left anything to imagination in the 51 page document that's available freely to download. And uh, to such an extent, uh, when you analyze what has been brought out in this, it appears as if it's in response to the national security document of 2017, as well as the document of 2018 on national security doctrine. So, you know. Uh, they have looked at it carefully. They have examined it. And it's quite clear, as Admiral also has brought out in his book, that they have a clear vision. The clear vision is to be a number one maritime power. In terms of near sheer numbers today, they already overtaken the US Navy. 
but mere numbers or uh, is not an indicator of the quality having commanded the carrier battle group admiral will watch for the fact that you know operating a dozen carrier battle groups by us navy is something that china has miles to go before they can achieve that's not something that's going to happen overnight the fact that they have three carriers today uh, to certain extent indicates the trajectory in which their maritime power potential is being explored i know in the most of these discussions i always uh, make it a point to tell our participants that even today the aircraft carrier though they have three of them have not crossed the straits of malacca they are not coming to the indian ocean region it's an important for us to note because obviously they are critically aware of the limitations that have been imposed because of the distances and also the fact that indian ocean region is virtually the backyard of india you know where we have a potent navy so when you are looking at the the defense paper for me i think all these discussions obviously start with the defense paper that uh, china has put out as a white paper and those 51 pages are quite clear and then some of the uh, the paragraphs that are there uh, indicate uh, at least on the on paper they try to say that you know uh, we would like to bring about a harmonious relation amongst the you know of, of the countries in the region and you know we would like to contribute to security stability so but we know right from the days of french shield that they something but they mean something else so which is why you know there are serious developments in the indo pacific and <clears throat> they also have clearly followed admiral uh, tair mahan is very clear that you know uh, of course the us navy embraced admiral mahan in its full uh, ambit and uh, china was uh, not far behind in trying to understand the constituents of sepa and therefore you see that you know not only have they just looked up the navy So they looked at shipbuilding, ship repair, and the ability to have uh, a merchant fleet that that can capture the markets of the world, uh, not just on their own, but also through uh, the ambitious Belt and Road Initiative. The Belt and Road Initiative is an important segment of their maritime outreach to continents across Asia and Africa, and which is where they are looking at the future. And uh, uh, as it was also brought out by Bala, they are looking at a target of 2050. 2050 in uh, for them is an important thing because 2049 they complete 100 years of uh, <coughs> their uh, party and uh, you know they obviously uh, here is where uh, we need to look at more in terms of the implications i am sure admiral will uh, tell us about the implications because what they want to do in the next 20 30 years is very clear you know i was looking at some of the statistics and it, it is amazing that in the last 10 years They have had something like 4,600 maritime security patrol operations. That's a huge number. It's not only uh, just in South China Sea, but also along the African coast. You know where the anti-piracy patrols give them a very good excuse uh, to keep up a combat patrol of uh, two ships continuously there, round the clock, and it's still ongoing. And that's more uh, uh, an effort to understand the the elements there, understand the traffic pattern. And, and you know, put all this into their database, which would be useful when they start taking the ships out of Djibouti. So this is where there is a pattern to what they do. There is a scheme that is working. There is a clear-cut objective that they would like to define, and you know, which is what they have done in the 51-page document, and uh, <clears throat> which is also has made uh, some of these uh, uh, options, such as the Quad in the Indo-Pacific, come alive more so after 2017. You know, while it lay dormant for nearly a decade, uh, some of the recent developments after COVID and also the aggressive behavior of China has made some of these, uh, you know, platforms, uh, you know, become uh, useful tools uh, to take on China uh, in the area of great importance to uh, humanity in terms of security, stability, uh, and prosperity. So you also have an AUKUS which has happened there. Of course, Admiral's book. talks about all this and more importantly the most important point that he has highlighted here is on the importance of slocks the seals of communication because here we know that it is the slocks that are important for meeting the energy security of uh, the east asian countries india china you know a countries like india and china are dependent on uh, you know energy uh, transportation uh, up to 85 to 90% of their requirement that is a huge vulnerability so this is where there are some options that throw themselves up for partners such as usa japan australia and india to work on the options to see how we can make china behave 
you know it's not about confronting china but trying to uh, bring china into the ambit of a rule based order of which we are increasingly you know focusing our attention so uh, like i always say it is not my talk it is the admiral's talk and you know it was only to uh, open up some uh, and flag some issues related to uh, the developments in the indo pacific and uh, there of the request that will uh, to kindly uh, take over and uh, tell us about uh, most importantly about the implications or what we can do together i think that that would be more important for all of us over to admiral well thank you thank you both for uh, such a, a marvelous introduction and i first want to say good evening to uh, all my colleagues and friends in india uh and uh this is my first experience uh uh with uh, the Sh uh, Chennai Center of China with China Studies but it's certainly not my first with National Maritime Foundation and uh I've had the great pleasure of uh, being associated with uh with NMF for well over a decade now and what I, regarding my book uh, which is I'm going to talk about for about 30 minutes is what the uh, program suggested and so if uh, if I run on too long please wave a white flag or uh, or or something to warn me to shut up so we can get to the question and answer uh which is uh, perhaps the most important uh, point why did I write the book well about 10 years ago I was wading through an english version of the uh President Hu Jintao's uh, 2012 work report to the uh, 18th uh, 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 Party Congress uh, and came across a statement that said that China should become a maritime great power. This was a statement of intent and in a speech that was thoroughly vetted by party leaders and it certainly piqued my interest and frankly surprised me. because i i believe uh, and still do that this was the first time in its long history that a chinese leader announced that china a traditional continental power aspired also to become a maritime great power and this in turn led to the obvious question why did china want to become a maritime great power i had been following china's naval developments uh, for some years before uh, the 2000 a uh, 12 uh, uh, speech by Hu Jintao uh but the notion of maritime power was not just about the navy it was a, a broader construct one that depended on a strong navy but also included all the other aspects of the maritime endeavor merchant marine shipbuilding fishing the coast guard hydrographic research deep submergence uh, deep sea mining and so forth who is not simply mouthing one more political aspiration what he said was not a passing party fancy as we have actually witnessed over the past 10 years since he made that ambition public it has become a central national objective of the chinese party state in the book i explore the imperatives that have caused the leaders of china to conclude that china's maritime power is a strategic imperative briefly here the four key points i believe are first china's gen genuine or strategic circumstances have changed dramatically over the past 30 odd years since the 1990s the dramatic growth in china's economy dependence on trade its go out strategy uh have made clear to the party china's economic well-being rests heavily on access to overseas resources and trade growing dependence on food im imports uh has is also uh, a major consideration uh as our access to the raw materials from abroad oil iron coal uh are essential for continued uh, economic uh, expansion Since 2009 China has been the world's largest exporter and since then has ranked either first or second as the world's leading trading nation. Obviously as this audience knows that the bulk of China's trade in natural resources come via sea and protecting these sea lanes that maritime that the maritime commerce uses is a mission that has been increasingly care for the PLA navy. China's defense white paper of 2015 entitled China's military strategy 
strategy made this abundantly clear with the statement that, quote, the security of a strategic sea lane lines of communication was becoming an eminent issue. Succeeding white papers and uh, have returned in one way or another to this point. As a result in the book, I spend some time addressing this concern and have concluded that the best way to discuss or to think about uh, China and its sea lines is to say that Be Beijing has sea lane anxiety. Um, and I'll get to why that is so in a moment here. A second imperative is China's global economic interests have in turn created political and security interests abroad. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative certainly is a leading example of its overseas interests that also include the safety of several million Chinese workers and tourists abroad, often in dangerous places. Third, China's most important unresolved security interests are maritime in nature. Regard, uh, regaining de facto sovereignty over Taiwan is the leading one. And as everybody realizes, it's the most dangerous uh, of its security uh, interests. And I'll also address Taiwan in more detail in, in a moment. And its security objectives in the South China Sea include evicting what it considers trespassers from some 40 or so spratly features that are occupied by either Vietnamese or Filipinos or Malaysians. China's goal remains complete control over all the above water land features inside the uh, so-called nine dash line. Now it wants to do this without starting a war. And thanks to its new islands, uh, island bases in the South China Sea has created a new street strategic rally, uh, reality in, in at least that, the southern portion of that body of water uh, that greatly favors Beijing. And we can talk more about that in a cute question and answer for anybody who's uh, wants more detail. Finally, a fourth imperative, a great maritime power is required to defend China from successful attack from the sea, something the United States has historically demonstrated it is uniquely qualified to do. We, can, we cannot forget, and Xi Jinping does not let us do so by reminding us frequently that China's century of humiliation was triggered by successful attacks from the sea that incidentally came via the South China Sea. Even before the People's Republic was established in 1949, the U.S. has maintained a substantial military presence that is figuratively on China's doorstep, a presence that has never served Beijing's interests and for 70 years has postponed the final unification of China and Taiwan. These are the four strategic uh, drivers, I believe, of the China's maritime power ambition. But in the book, I explore, at least address, uh, two other uh, drivers that I believe are that they are not necessarily based on hard-nosed strategic judgment. The first of these is based on a scientific study of history, and we must never forget we're dealing with scientific socialists now. In 2006. A government-sponsored study on the historic rise of great powers was completed uh, for Hu Jintao. This scholar, scholarly study, entitled The Rise of Great Powers, concluded that maritime power was a key accelerant in the rise of great powers and that China could learn from the nine historic case studies that this study covered. They addressed Portugal, Spain, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom. France, Germany, Japan, Russia, and United States. I must add, I have not read uh, the English uh, versions of these, summaries of these, uh, but uh, there is an excellent one I've just come across and I'm starting to plow through it now. These are quite well done, by the way. These, a 12-part TV series followed along with an eight-volume book series, which became a bestseller in China. Finally, of course, China is bent on becoming a maritime great power because they can. The party is on board and has provided the green light to go ahead. It has the money, an abundance of talented human capital, the best shipbuilding infrastructure in the world, 
and a ruthless will to succeed by any measures necessary. I may now turn to some more some specifics about the PLA Navy. Beijing believes to be a legitimate great maritime power. China must possess a powerful navy because, it, because as they put it, the PLA Navy provides the essential, quote, strategic support for the entire maritime power ambition. In short, the Navy is the keystone to the entire Chinese maritime power edifice. The early chapters of my book cover the transition from a Navy that was a taking only baby steps towards blue water operations as recently as the early years of this century to one that has become a legitimate blue water expeditionary force that it is today. My favorite example is that it was not until 2002 before the PLA Navy was bold enough to dispatch a single warship and a supporting tanker on a 123 day, 32,000 a uh, nautical mile, mile voyage around the world, a PLA Navy first. I say this not in a, uh, to belittle them or, or make fun, but to highlight how far and fast that they have come in just 20 years. How did this transmission, or tra transmission, how did this transformation from a coastally oriented Navy to one that is globally capable that we see today take place in such a relatively short span of years. First and foremost, ample resources, and as I addressed already, a strategic demand st uh, signal and political will. But I also argue that for almost 14 years now of continuous anti-piracy deployments, thousands of miles away from China in the far reaches of the Indian Ocean has been a key accelerant in this dramatic rise. Now, it is popular to call PLA Navy deployments to the Gulf of Aden anti-piracy operations, but they also can be understood as an example of the PLA Navy conducting sea lane protection operations. In any event, these operations have been what I called a blue water laboratory, where the PLAN learned how to sustain warships on station for many weeks at a time. They have mastered the logistics of on a deployed support not only underway replenishment operations, but also the routine daily maintenance and sustainment challenges many of us have experienced when at sea for weeks at a time. They have streamlined the processes for using China's state-owned trading and logistics support companies, such as Costco, the Chinese overseas shipping company, to handle import supply and other logistics. And the PLA has learned how to command and control ships operating 6,600 6, nautical miles away from China. It has learned how to organize protection operations in pirate uh, uh, infested, or not so much infested anymore, but uh, to de deter pirate uh, attacks. It has also capitalized on operating in the same waters as ships from the rest of the world's great navies, and was able to observe and adopt uh, best practices. This has been a tremendous confidence builder, I believe, for the PLA Navy and PLA Navy leaderships. We have to think back to 2008, when the first task group was dispatched to the Gulf of, Na of, of Aden. No one in Beijing knew for sure how this was going to work out. Would the ships be reliable, or would they end up breaking down and spending days in port? Would the sailors be able to perform well during sustained at sea operations? In short, could the Chinese Navy do this without embarrassing itself and China in front of all of those other navies? It has turned out that none of the, the problems uh, that they have worried about, or at least that we're aware of, uh, have occurred. It has demonstrated to itself, to its bosses in the Central Military Commission and the Politburo, that it could hold its own in the company of other great navies. The book spends some time on the takeoff of on Chinese naval warship procurement that began, I think, I, I mark it from roughly 2005. Since that time, uh, China has financed the building of enough modern modern warships, specifically 100 and what I 
my latest count is 133 blue water ships. In other words, ships that can go to the Indian Ocean and stay. Plus another 115 or so uh, new uh, ships more suitable for uh, near seas. In other words, somewhere in and around the first island chain in the, in the Western Pacific. That, so that total is roughly 248, 250 ships that have been uh, either commissioned or have been launched and are fitting out uh, since 2005. The up upshot of all of this, uh, these uh, building uh, uh, activities and what have you, has I believe that China has the second most capable navy in the world. When I call them the second most capable navy in the world, I mean capable in the sense of having substantial numbers of operationally reliable, very well armed, well equipped modern warships. The PLA is, Navy is well balanced in the sense that there is a good mix of ships and submarines designed for different missions. In this sense, the PLA Navy is closer to the United States Navy and having a balanced mi mission structure than is any other Navy in the world. Of course, we don't know how they would perform in combat. We do know that she, from Xi Jinping on down, the leadership of China continues to harp at the entire PLA to improve training, to conduct more realistic training, to learn how to operate in a joint environment. And the Navy has not been immune from these very high level public criticisms. As many of you know, although the national flag, it flies the national flag of China, the PLA Navy's loyalty is to the Chinese Communist Party. And Xi Jinping never lets them forget this. It is almost the first thing out of his mouth, no matter what the occasion, when he's speaking to, to the PLA and or the PLA Navy. Loyalty the, to the Chinese Communist Party. So this is a party Navy. It is not a national Navy. And the CCP, Chinese Communist Party, works hard to stamp out any thinking that suggests that the PLA is a national force. It is the armed wing of the Chinese Communist Party. It also happens to be a very big Navy. As I've, it is numerically larger than the US Navy. And if you apply the same counting rules the US Navy uses uh, to come out uh, to count its uh, force structure. The, the PLA Navy is the largest Navy in the world, around 345 uh, commissioned ships, while the U.S. Navy is today at around 295 or thereabouts. Uh, this is still a bit of a shock to me, anyway. But the U.S. Navy is still the largest in terms of tonnage and has numeric advan ad, uh, advantages in almost all of the major warfare areas that I believe really matter, such as 54 nuclear-powered attack submarines, 11 aircraft carriers, and well over 90 modern air defense destroyers. But the PLA Navy is gaining in these areas as well. 2017 was a pivotal year in Chinese naval history. In another of those reports that we talked about to the uh, Chinese Communist, uh, to the uh, uh, five-year Congress of the, of the party, Xi Jinping set the goal that the PLA must become a world-class force. And he wants to have that done by 20 feet. But he also has accelerated the due date in terms of hardware and capability. He said he wants to have his world-class, in this case, Navy, in hand by, in, by 2035. Now that's only 13 years away. So now, on the other hand, neither she nor any of the other senior officials have defined what world class means. But it certainly carries the connotation of being second to none, or being top tier, or being the best in the world. In the book, I try to put some flesh on these bones to provide a view of what world class means for the Na uh, PLA Navy, and I'll get to that. In two chapters, I cover in some detail the PLA Navy's contribution to uh, China's military layered defense concept, what the U.S. Defense Department 
calls anti-axis and area denial, better known as A2AD. By layered, I mean a combination of missiles, forward deployed submarine groups, land-based aircraft with anti-ship cruise missiles. But I need to emphasize that when it comes to anti-aircraft, uh, A2AD or anti-axis area denial, or in the book, as I call it, counter-intervention, I'm not just talking about a Navy to Navy matchup. Too many commentators make this mistake and argue that, at least in the United States, people are saying, well, the US Navy needs to get bigger because the Chinese Navy is bigger. It's not a Navy on Navy competition we're talking about. This is an all service, multi domain joint military campaign from both the Chinese perspective as well as from the United States perspective. And it involves the Chinese Navy, the Chinese Air Force, the Chinese Rocket Force, and the Chinese Strategic Support Force. And of course, the PLA Army, if the objective is to inv uh, invade Taiwan. So it's not, I, I want to emphasize again, it's not just a, a naval building race that we're talking about here. In fact, I often say that if it was strictly a Navy to Navy fight, the United States Navy would wax the Chinese Navy today. But in the book, I devote a chapter to area denial, which takes place largely in and around the first island chain. Uh, and, and one to anti-axis. The, the anti-axis fighting uh, is, takes place largely between the first and second island chain. And that's the one that's reached, received the most public commentary because of Chinese capability to use ballistic missiles to, to attempt to target moving ships moving west from the Eastern Pacific toward China, most likely via the Philippine Sea. The idea is to present a problem for surface ships sailing westward from the United States, uh, for example, to defend Taiwan, to have to deal with anti-ship ballistic missile attacks, along with having to fight their way through a PLA Navy submarine barriers, perhaps wolf packs, similar types of uh, 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 approach to attacking uh, strike groups, waiting to pounce, or to mention, uh, uh, or not to mention, Land-based aircraft, long-range, uh, uh, their bombers, uh, and with long-range cruise missiles. So it's a, it is a very, very layered defense, but it has a key weakness, a key weakness. It depends largely, in fact, almost entirely for targeting on space-based surveillance. It, without space-based surveillance to give them ag accurate targeting, uh, this thing, this this is their Achilles heel, and it won't work without that. It can't. ASBMs cannot be precisely targeted if you hope to hit a moving ship. Similarly, conventionally powered submarines can't be accurately vectored to attack. It's a big ocean out there, and you need a need somewhere to point you in the right direction. And remember, uh, most of their submarines are conventionally powered and don't move all that quickly. Uh, and the same thing for land-based aircraft. You have to be able to kind of vector them where they go, where to go, where to point them where the targets are. It's, so the bottom line is that uh, my judgment is uh, to prevail in a fight against China in the uh, in the Philippine Sea, the anti-axis uh, area denial uh, fight. We're going to have to deal with Chinese satellites in one way or another. Taiwan is an important uh, ta topic of the book because it is the most credible friction point in East Asia that could involve the U.S. in a war with China. The book looks at the central role the, uh, the Navy, the PLA Navy, has on a Taiwan campaign, and and suggests, despite its significant size already, if you look at all the different uh, areas that it has to be involved in. It may not have the right numbers yet. It may it may need to get bigger. In this book, I also addressed how U.S. first responders, those that are already stationed uh, in Japan and in East Asia, the U.S. Seventh Fleet, U.S. Fifth Air Force, and the Marine Forces in Okinawa, 
is going to face the entirety of China's military est establishment for a good long time before reinforcements uh, can make can can be brought to the fight uh, from the United States or from uh, the Pacific or from I mean for Hawaii or Guam. So as a result, they're going to be hugely outnumbered. They're going to uh, face a, uh, a real firepower disadvantage uh, from the very beginning. Now, the book also addresses the really tough choice that Beijing will face that should it or should it not attack U.S. air bases in Japan to take land-based U.S. air power in the region out of the fight and possibly land-based air power in South Korea. And that an, an attack that almost certainly would bring Japan and probably South Korea into the into the war. In the book, I assume that China will attack, and in, in order to illuminate the importance of Japan's contribution to the to the conflict. Admiral, sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, there are plenty of questions yes. in the chat box, so you have another five minutes, Admiral. Okay, I'm good. I'm just about I'm just about at the end here. I, I devote chapters to the South China Sea and the Indian uh, Ocean, and as this audience knows, China has maintained a modest but continuous naval presence in the Indian Ocean. Uh, but, and this is their big weakness, and this is India's great advantage, when the Chinese Navy sails out from underneath its land-based uh, and missile umbrella in the Western Pacific, it becomes a very vulnerable force, especially in the Indian Ocean. Now, it's trying hard to, le to learn how to bring its own air cover along with its ships in the Indian Ocean, uh, i.e. their aircraft carriers, but it still has a long way to go because it doesn't really have a decent carrier-capable fighter yet. In the final chapter of the book, I return to the broader concept of maritime power and highlight again that China's uh, decision in two, announced in 2012 was not a bold out of the blue aspiration, but rather China already was a matter, maritime power and remains so today. It's the global leader in shipbuilding. It has the largest merchant marine. Some 5,000 merchant ships are Chinese owned. It has the largest coast guard, some 250 or odd uh, ocean going cutters, and far and away the world's largest fishing fleet, and over somewhere around 300,000 is the leader in maritime research and exploration. So what will, to wrap up, what will China, what do I think China's world-class Navy, what will it look like? How big will it be? We don't know it's gonna be big, but uh, I would guess is that by 2035, it's gonna be about 425 ships, uh, uh, a 425 ship uh, force with a global, expeditionary capability, uh, mimicking the balance and capabilities of the U.S. Navy. And a Navy this size will certainly be world class. So why don't I stop there and take the question. Thank you, uh, Atharul, for the uh, insightful talk. Uh, I'll be taking uh, questions for you from the chat box. The first question is by Commodore Basin. He has asked, whether it is the conversion of reefs and rocks as islands to support military garrisons or the A to AD, the idea is clearly to push the U.S. forces further from the first and second lines of defense, that the island chains of defense. What are the counters in the pipeline in addition to AUKUS hypersonic missiles among several others? Well, uh, I think I think the U.S. is putting a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of their chips in the hypersonic basket. But I think the, um, uh, the key thing is a naval officer, it pains me to have to say this, but it's going to be the long-range Air Force bombers uh, that uh, with long-range uh, anti-ship cruise missiles. Uh, I think the beginning of wisdom, particularly in a, a Taiwan scenario, is to recognize that the U.S. cannot make Taiwan bulletproof. If China decides to attack, Taiwan is going to be uh, pummeled. We see it going on in Ukraine today. It's going to be hit by, by long-range missiles, and, possibly, and, and if it takes out Taiwan's air force by uh, uh, Chinese land-based air power. 
And there's not much the U.S. can do to prevent that. But what the U.S. still can do is prevent a successful invasion of Taiwan. So if Taiwan's willing to fight it out and take the pounding, uh, the U.S. can, in fact, uh, I think, uh, surmount uh, the A2AD problem largely uh, through submarines uh, and uh, long-range Air Force bombers firing long-range uh, anti-ship cruise missiles at targets in the uh, Taiwan Strait. And if the U.S. Navy finally gets the, it's working now on its uh, drone tankers to Im include those in the air wing on carriers. If we get that done to be able to provide organic tanking capability uh, for the air wing so that in fact uh, uh, the carriers can remain uh, distant from, uh, from uh, uh, the well into the Philippine Sea or north the second or near the second island chain and still launch uh, uh, F-18s and F-35s with tanking support that's organic where, where it can get within cruise missile range of, of the region. I don't see, at this point, I don't see a way that uh, U.S. fighters, uh, be they Air Force or Navy or Marine Corps for that matter, could successfully uh, conduct, uh, contest an air battle over Taiwan. In other words, a fight for air superiority over Taiwan or over the Taiwan Strait. I just don't think that's possible because it would involve um, attacking Chinese uh, airfields and air bases uh, in China uh, in dealing with their dispersion. And as we've seen, uh, the United States, uh, the President Biden said, we're not going to start World War III by getting involved in shooting at Russians in Ukraine, right after Putin was quick to put his nuclear weapons on the table. Well, China's growth in, uh, in their nuclear uh, arsenal, if it continues apace, over time, all of a sudden, it's going to become a very significant deterrent about at least causing a U.S. administration to have to think twice about attacking downtown, going and attacking the Chinese mainland. And so uh, having the capability to fight from afar, from long range, is going to be increasingly important. I hope that's a very long answer to your question. I apologize. Sir. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, moving on to my question, the next one. Uh, can you please share your thoughts on China's maritime militia? and how it is used to achieve political objectives in disputed waters. Well, much has been made about the maritime militia, uh, mainly in the South China Sea, and of course it shows up periodically in the East China Sea. Um, uh, and it's, a, it's effectively uh, uh, a good, what I would call a good supplement to the uh, co Coast Guard, Chinese Coast Guard, to help police, if you will, uh, uh, and drive off fishermen uh, and in other activity or uh, oil research vessels and uh, people that that perhaps the Philippines or Vietnam Vietnam has hired to do uh, uh, research so they can uh, uh, take advantage of the oil in their uh, exclusive economic zones or underneath their exclusive economic zones. And so they provide a very good harassment force and what have you. And they have some wartime missions. The one that's always um, always amused me is the, that the wartime mission of putting radar reflectors on their, their little their fishing boats so that they look like they're bigger targets. Now, I'm not sure they've asked the fishermen if they're interested in being bigger targets. But, um, uh, uh, but the point is uh, they have surveillance uh, reporting capabilities and what have you uh, in in the in the East China Sea and the South China Sea but it, I can they're more of a constabulary problem than a military problem thank you sir uh, the next question is also from Commodore Vasan he has asked uh, what in your assessment would be the tipping point for us on Taiwan which has been identified as one of the core interests well, I, 
I think the tipping point is uh, actual kinetic use. In other words, China starts shooting things at uh, I don't, uh, you know, there's been a lot of speculation, I think, in the, in the, in the commentariat uh, about would the U.S. Uh, consider a, a, a serious cyber attack on uh, Taiwan as reason to, uh, to use kinetic force against China. And I think that's probably not the case. My guess would be the U.S. might return the favor and, and assist Taiwan in, in conducting cyber operations. But uh, I don't think that uh, unless China starts shooting uh, and killing, Ty and killing uh, 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 Taiwanese, uh, I, I, I think that, well, I think that's the tipping point, not, not cyber attack. But obviously th this is speculation. It's, uh, you know, Trying to trying to have an opinion about what's going to happen is is very difficult in this particular case. Uh, when you're talking about war and peace, and that means you have to consider what is the domestic political uh, feeling in the United States. Uh, are when faced with the prospect of potentially going to war with China over Taiwan, would the U.S. public support that or not? And if the public is against it, would the Congress uh, support it or not? And so th there's. Lots of uncertainty here. Thank you, Admiral. The next question is by uh, Dr. L. V. Krishnan. He has asked, China is now highly dependent on imports to feed the people. That includes fish. One estimate is that by the end of this decade, nearly 40% of world's catch will be needed to satisfy Chinese people. Is competition in fishing likely to become the start of a conflict? Uh, I, I, maybe, uh, well, first of all, let me say, uh, your, that thumbnail analysis in, embedded in the question about the voracious appetite of uh, China for, uh, for fish and how rapacious their fishing fleets have been around the world is a matter of global concern, I think, and it, it receives too little publicity. It's a, it, it is a serious issue. Uh, but to the gist of the question, will it start a shooting conflict? Now, we don't have the example of Iceland and the UK getting, getting in the, 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 the fisherman conflict over, over fishing rights. But, and so I could see potentially something like that happening in the South China Sea between Vietnam and China. But it would be uh, manageable, quickly managed, I think, uh, by both sides, and they would back off and stop and stop shooting at each other and what have you. And so, it those kinds of uh, dust ups, and it, certainly, the South Koreans and the Chinese fishing fleets have already engaged, and, and people have been killed on both sides. And the Chi uh, South Korean Coast Guard has had Coast Guardsmen killed by Chinese fishermen, uh, and vice versa. The, South Korean Coast Guard is, uh, they fired a flare and it set a fishing boat on fire, a Chinese fishing boat on fire and burned up the crew. And so there has been a low level off and on, on again, off again uh, uh, fight going on in the LOC today or over the past few years uh, over fishing. Uh, but uh, again, it's been, it, it's easily controllable. So I don't think, I don't think fishing will lead to a major a great power conf uh, confrontation, mainly because the U.S. doesn't have that many fishing boats it's of its own, and so uh, uh, the confrontation would be the between the U.S. Coast Guard and Chinese fishermen. So, thank you, Admiral. The next question is from uh, Colonel Hari Haran. He has asked, "You have spoken of world-class shipbuilding facilities of China. However, navies in Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Pakistan." which have procured warships from China have complained of recurring problems in operating them. The Chinese seem to have problems in precision engineering capabilities in manufacturing of engines for not only ships, but also for fighter aircraft and even modern tanks. Your comments, please. Well, it's interesting. Uh, quite frankly, I think you probably, uh, the, the questioner probably has a better idea of what, uh, uh, with the complaints from uh, friends who have, uh, are 
operating new uh, Chinese ships. Uh, now, some of that may be the fact that uh, they didn't uh, buy uh, appropriate uh, logistic support, uh, backup support, so that there's a spare, if it's a spare parts problem, that's one thing. If it's just shoddy equipment and shoddy building, that's another thing. Um, and I don't know. Quite frankly, uh, the ships that China has dispatched out and about the world and what have you, some, you know, for uh, until COVID hit, they were sending their their anti-piracy patrols after they finished the piracy patrol. They were sending them on another four months worth of port visits around Africa and in the Mediterranean. So portal to portal, by the time those ships got home, they were that was a seven-month deployment. Well, that was like a regular U.S. Navy deployment. And I was impressed by that, that these, these three ships that did that, and many of them did that, it wasn't the same three ships, that they were pretty reliable. No, there were no at least reports of major breakdowns or anything like that. Ships came and went and did their thing, and so that gave it had left me with the impression uh, that uh, they were pretty well uh, maintained and supplied. Now, I have also over over the, since since the book really has been completed and I've been continuing to keep an eye on things. Uh, it does strike me that very few Chinese ships get underway for any period of time. They have a big navy. But it's uh, other than exercises very close to home, uh, not a lot of them are out and about at any given time. Now, I'm old enough to remember that the the Cold War and everybody wondering why isn't the Soviet Navy? They, there was a period there when they were out and about, but why were they also spending so much time in port? Well, as I understood the Soviet. Uh, maintenance philosophy was why should we wear it out just getting underway to get underway we'll make sure that the we'll, we'll maintain our readiness by being in port and keeping keeping everything uh, up and running now maybe the chinese are doing that i just don't know that i don't know the answer to that but i would be interested in learning more about what the complaints are from uh, from uh, people who are using chinese uh, navy uh, china or sailing uh, chinese ships Thank you, Admiral. Uh, I have a question, Admiral. China in 21 passed two important legislations. One, the Maritime Traffic Safety Law and a new Coast Guard Law. How will they affect equations in the Indo-Pacific and what are their future implications? Ah, well, I, I, that's a very good question. Um, and I've, we've, I've had these discussions with colleagues from NMF before. And so, um, there's two ways to look at this issue, that what China is doing in the, in, in the South China Sea is, is a stalking horse for what they're going to do around the world if they get the chance, they're, that, that, they're, that they will try to apply uh, rules and regulations more broadly and interpret, uh, interpret uh, the law of the sea or, or uh, uh, in different ways to uh, allow them to uh, gain control and bodies of water and what have you or resources further afield. The other point of view is what's going on in the South China Sea and the East China Sea is sui generis, that it's unique because it it is involved with directly with long-held Chinese cl sovereignty claims and claims of jurisdiction and that what they're doing in the south china sea in terms of coast guard laws and what have you is is not not apparently e easily applicable to some place in the, the eastern pacific or the indian ocean or what or the south pacific uh, i i happen to uh think that it's that it it's sui generis that that it is not necessarily a sinister stalking horse for what China is going to do in the future. But I can be easily persuaded to go the other way uh, uh, with if, if we have some evidence or good or a good uh, I, idea of where ch China is going. I just don't know, but that's how I would parse the problem. Thank you, Peru. The next question is from uh, Kamaru. Vasan. He has asked. What lessons have been learned 
from the Russian Ukraine conflict, which the PLA Navy likes to work on if and when it wants to take over Taiwan? Well, the first thing it should learn is uh, hopefully their damage control is up to snuff and not like the Muscova. Um, uh, and so it, they hopefully have recognized that uh, two cruise missile hits above the waterline in a ship, uh, you would not you would not expect it to sink the ship. You might expect it to put it out of commission and fire. But so how did how did that ship sink then? Uh, the magazines and the missiles blew blow up. Did they flood it with firefighting water to the point where the ship broke up in heavy weather? I don't know. But the point of it is, uh, the Chinese ought to be asking themselves about uh, how resilient uh, their ships are uh, to cruise missile hits that are certainly going to be above the waterline. Uh, and are they liable to sink on them, or are they going to just are they going to burn them? Uh, will it burn them up or not? Um, and they've studied the Falkland Islands campaign uh, extensively, and in in the, the British, in the, the Brits had the same problem. Uh, a cruise missile hit starts a fire, and eventually they sink the ship themselves with trying to put the fire out. Fire means burst and what have you, and uh, and you, internal flooding. So it, uh, I I would say that's probably number one. Uh, right now, in terms of uh, the lessons learned, the second part of that is how good is their def are their defenses so that a cruise missile can't make it through, uh, and uh, are they are they going to be able to deal with the cruise cruise missile uh, that the U.S. is developing? Now, they've known about the cruise missile threat, but here they're seeing it manifest again, and so the question is, uh, th those I think would be the 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 big lessons I would learn. Um, uh, mine warfare, it's not entirely clear to me, you know, the, both the Ukrainians and the Russians are laying mines in the Black Sea. Uh, and so uh, that's something we haven't heard much about it except that they're there. Um, uh, and so in terms of denial, uh, Denying access or a exit for the uh, grain carriers is one, is an is a, a ongoing issue. Who's going to sweep the mines, and how do we keep the other side from laying new ones? Um, and so that's a that's a real world scenario that could play out between Taiwan and China that both sides are laying mines. And so, what lessons they will be? They're going to have to talk to the. They're going to have to get the Russians to meet with them and discuss in detail, or the Ukrainians or both, the implications of, of the mine warfare there. Admiral, the next question is from uh, Colonel Harikaran. He has asked, how do you visualize employment of China's fishing militia in times of uh, operations? Well, obviously, if we have, you have to be close to China. And so, yes, if we have warships, uh, and we do, the Seventh Fleet's going to be in the in and around the First Island chain. So the maritime militia may be out in the South China Sea or the East China Sea. And so, if we have U.S. ships around that area, we're going to have to be very conscious. I think the U the U.S. Navy has already uh, previous CNO has already made the statement that that uh, we're going to we're going to treat them like warships uh, if they try to. Uh, uh, do hostile activity. We're not going to give them a free pass because, quote, they're fishing boats. So uh, I, I think, uh, I'm guessing, and I, I'm sure that uh, wartime rules of engagement uh, would uh, permit uh, U.S. ships to take uh, maritime militia or anybody, any other fishing boat for that matter, that is harassing or trying to get close enough to take a shot at them with a shoulder-fired uh, crew, uh, 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 anti-tank weapon uh, type of uh, or something like that uh, that we would fire away. Uh, you know, we 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 the U.S. Navy deals with this off and on, and I'm not sure. Maybe maybe you do as well. Your Navy does as well. Every time you go through the Straits of Hormuz, and the IRGC is out and about uh, uh, making uh, making uh, high speed passes and what have you. You've got small boats coming close uh, with uh, that are armed. 
And so uh, uh, the war, the, the ship, the, the destroyers and, and larger ships have to be prepared to deal with that. And, and I think that would, uh, I think that's what we would be prepared to deal with the Chinese maritime militia in times of conflict. Uh, the next question is from uh, Saparna Chandrasekharan. She has asked, how does the Indian Navy compare to the Chinese Navy in terms of performance and not just fleet size? Well, I, I honestly uh, have, have never operated with the Indian Navy. But then again, I've never operated with the PLA Navy either. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's strictly looking, it's, it's an external, you know, all I can see is what's going on out, uh, that is visible. I have no idea what's going on inside the lifelines, um, uh, and so it's 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 a di it's a difficult thing to compare. The Indian Navy has been at this a lot longer than the PLA Navy has. That's for sure. And you've been at operating aircraft carriers for a lot longer, uh, and you uh, and so it's a it's a it's a fair judgment. Uh, but uh, you know, the reality is. Uh, is we're learning in it, uh, in Ukraine is uh, numbers have a quality all of their own uh, and so um, no matter how brilliant the Indian Navy is uh, in terms of its operational and tactical uh, uh, and weapon weapons employment uh, if it comes to a shootout uh, you're gonna it's gonna be uh, you're gonna be outnumbered but, 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 remember, for that shootout to happen in the Indian Ocean, you have the advantage of land-based air power. Now, whether you can convince your Air Force to get, to, to be interested in attacking ships is another matter. Uh, but um, uh, certainly, you have all the advantages ge uh, the, uh, the geography provides. The one thing I would worry about is certainly the range of the uh, China's ASBM does reach into parts of the Indian Ocean, the Bay of Bengal, uh, northern Ra the Arabian Sea, and uh, 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 and the, the the longer range ones uh, cover most of the uh, uh, northern uh, uh, Indian Ocean, and so whether China is actually practicing targeting and doing all of those sorts of things so they can use ASBMs against Indian ship or any ship in the, in the uh, Indian Ocean is another matter. So that's a factor you have to consider. And I know that, you, that, some, that some amongst you have already spent a lot of time thinking about that. But you have, that has to be part of the equation when you talk about, uh, again, it's not just a Navy-to-Navy -Navy shootout here. It's going to be uh, uh, air forces are going to be involved and potentially rocket forces are going to be involved. Uh, Admiral, the next question is from Kamado Vasan. He has asked, uh, Admiral, you have made an important observation about the unproven, untested combat capability of the PLA Navy. PLA Navy would be acutely aware of this limitation. Then, how in your assessment would this be addressed by the leadership in China? Mere wargaming would not help that cause. Well, the, well, you know, the best you can do is wargaming. Uh, and so that's the problem is um, war games, war games, well, they can show some, uh, give you insights into how things might play out. But uh, war games do do a crummy job. I've I've always thought of of realistic tactical engagements, uh, realistic ASW, um, and and the likelihood of uh, of shooting at wrong targets and what have you. And so uh, it's it's. Difficult, I think, because war games just are not granular enough and can't be. I don't think they can crack granular enough to to actually measure how it, how it would really play out. So the best you can do is war games, but I it, it would you you have to be um, very capable, uh, very careful about what lessons or you, you what things you believe of that, particularly based upon who you have playing red. Who is the red team? 
uh, if it's going to be uh, Indian China specialists, like in the United States, you have American China specialists playing China, and you're going to have Indian China specialists playing China. Uh, you know, it's uh, they may be good on bigger picture uh, intelligence, but in terms of how you would model an, an engagement at sea and what have you, I, it's 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 very granular. It's it's, it's a very broad uh, and uh, not granular enough, I, I believe, to reach any firm firm conclusions. Uh, I believe the next question is from uh, Colonel Hari Haran. He has asked, China is making strategic foreign policy forays in the Pacific Island nations. Do you expect PLA Navy to enter this region in strength in the region that are traditionally being dominated by the US Navy and US Marine Corps? If so, any time frame before they can do it? Well, I would make one correction to the question. Uh, the, in the South Pacific, uh, the U.S. Navy has largely, for decades, ex ignored the South Pacific, uh, and uh, and uh, was happy to have the Australians and the New Zealanders uh, looking after uh, security interests in, in that region. Um, the U.S. would only send token ships periodically there, uh, and so. Uh, there has been a, in terms of substantial naval presence, uh, there hasn't been substantial naval presence there uh, since the atomic uh, weapons tests in Micronesia in the in the 1950s. So there's been periodic visits and what have you. But and so it's it's kind of off the beaten path, and I would say it's probably going to be off the beaten path for the PLA Navy too. They're probably going to send ships down there periodically and. Uh, they have, uh, you know, uh, uh, to make port visits and what have you, but it's um, uh, it's uh, not likely that they're going to have any kind of a rotation. Uh, I would doubt. I would be shocked if they had something similar to what we see uh, in the uh, Northern Arabian Sea with the with the, the standing task group that the PLA Navy has maintained for all these many years. I'd be surprised to see something like that on a ro rotational presence down the South Pacific. And if we did, I would expect to see Australia, New Zealand, and U.S. small task groups down there as well, keeping track of what's going on. But uh, I don't see that happening in the part of the U.S. or uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, until, until China makes a move in that direction. An occasional port fit is not the same thing as, as maintaining a a more or less periodic presence. So. Thank you, Bill. The next question is from uh, from Aparna Chandrasekharan, Ms. Aparna Chandrasekharan. She has asked, does the recent quad cooperation efforts between US, Japan, India, and Australia have any implications for increase in naval capacity in China? And consequently, does it also impact the Indian Navy? I, could you repeat? Repeat the last part of that. I I didn't didn't catch a connection in the question. Uh, Admiral, she has asked, does the recent Quad cooperation will have any impact or implications for increase in the naval capacity in China, and will it also, as a consequence, impact the Indian Navy? Oh, um, I don't think it's. I think uh, the size or the capacity of the PLA Navy is being driven by internal decisions. Uh, they know where they, they, I think they have an idea where, how big they want to become and what capabilities they want to have. And I think they're going to march down that path and that, and that the quad, uh, th they've already accounted for the, the size of the Indian Navy and the Australian Navy uh, and the Japanese Navy uh, in the, U the U.S. Navy, they know what's there, and they also know that they're growing at a pace that none of these navies are keeping up with, um, and none of the other navies are keeping up with. And so, so that they're uh, uh, 
I don't think they're worried about all of a sudden being surprised by a building spurt that would 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 disadvantage them. That I think that they they believe that at least in terms of numbers and, uh, and capabilities that they are going to uh, it, when operating in their home turf and in their in their part of the Pacific and what have you that they have they have an advantage uh, and they're not likely to lose it on. Uh, because of the quad. Uh, I believe the next question is from uh, Captain Kiran Kankoji. He has asked, uh, Admiral, do you consider Taiwan effectively a lost cause since US won't put its boots oh, no. on and won't instigate by targeting the mainland China? There won't be a fight in support of Taiwan by the US, more like Ukraine. No, I don't consider Taiwan a lost cause. Um, I think it, Taiwan has has the great advantage of a hundred mile wide moat, um, and as long as the people of Taiwan are willing to fight, this has always been the question in the minds of anybody who looks closely at the, at the at the cross strait issue. If the people of Taiwan are willing to fight, like the people of Ukraine are willing to fight, uh, then it's not a lost cause at all. But it's also possible that one of the lessons when all is said and done, if in fact the Russians really do wind up beating the bejesus out of Ukraine and they quit, uh, and it turns out badly for Ukraine, one of the lessons that may be learned by the people of Taiwan is it's not worth it to see our country destroyed. And so uh, they they are the ones who determine if it's a lost cause or not. It's not the United States. Thank you, Admiral. The last question for the Q&A session would be from uh, Commodore Vijesh Garg. He has asked, Admiral, how do you see the Chinese operations from the recent third aircraft carrier uh, using the EMOLS, which is an electromagnetic uh, aircraft launch system, uh, knowing that the problems being faced with the uh, US naval carrier? Well, that's a good, <laughs> that's, you know, I, I only wish all the problems that, that we've had on them, quite frankly. Uh, uh, you know, that, that third aircraft carrier is an entirely new design. Entirely new design. And they've dumped all kinds of new stuff in it, just like we did with the Ford class. And here we are, what, you know, eight, 11 years later, still trying to get the thing deployed. Um, and so, so uh, they, they're going to have a lot of bugs to work out. Any new ship design is going to have that. But they, you know, it, this is kind of new from the, from the keel up. And so, uh, if if they've come up with an uh, an email that's very effective and what that that'll just be one of God knows how many other problems. And on top of everything, they need a decent fighter. They need a decent jet. They needed they needed a, a, a catapult launched uh, uh, AEW aircraft, airborne early warning aircraft. So the air wing is the reason that you have an aircraft carrier, is my argument, you know, duh. Why do we have an aircraft carrier? So we can use airplanes. Uh, and so um, uh, they, have, they haven't come to grips. They're starting to come to grips with that now. But, and so in the meantime, they're going to have the J-15 uh, flying shark with a jury rig on the, on the nose wheel to try to launch it. Well, you know. We're going to find out if maybe three three launches down the nose wheel craps out. Who knows? I mean, there's lots of things that are that are uncertainties here. So I I'm not holding my breath. We're going to see the third, the Fujian. Uh, it's uh, doing anything more than sea trials uh, for a long, 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 long time. Thank you. Uh very much, Admiral, for patiently taking uh, all our questions. Many useful discussions were brought to the table. I now request uh, Commodore Vijesh Kumar Garg, uh, BSM, Executive Director, Chennai Center for China Studies, to kindly deliver the concluding address and vote of thanks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Bala.
Well, today evening was uh, so much of learning for all of us. And say from a horse's mouth, also from the Admiral's mouth, and the same Admiral's Bridge. I read this book in bits and pieces, and what I found very interesting the whole book, eight chapters, is covers the Chinese concept of maritime power, which Admiral covered so beautifully, starting from that any great power became, came from the maritime route. So why China should be a great power? We had to be maritime power. And of course, the book mentioned that political power comes from the barrel of the gun. The Chinese are copying that now. They realize that this is the most important part to do that. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, he discussed the Chinese maritime interest in, in, in all aspects. History of Pillar Navy, we started in 1985, very modest way. And then, of course, this 2014, which came with the military civil fusion, uh, stealing the technology from the West and then making the ship design and making the great ships, which uh, I think was a turning point in Chinese uh, shipbuilding or Chinese military thing because they started. Stealing the technology with always and in any way and trying to become great as any, any country was. He built up to how the Chinese Navy started going out from 2002 as a single ship was out, and then 2008, all of us saw they're going for the patrol, anti piracy patrol. The first time we saw actually Chinese ship coming around 2005 in the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea. I saw first time the Chinese ship in 2005 in my patrol, my first visit. Now, other thing is very important point which Admiral mentioned: the Chinese Navy is not a national navy; they are committed to the CCP, which unlike the other navies are. But well, they are there, there structure. Leave it there. He also discovered, he mentioned, and of course he covered during his talks and the question answers all issue around the Taiwan, what the scenario building, what can happen. First responders, what US has to offer if something happens, and what all the scenarios China, Taiwan, US, Quad, all issues were discussed and very nicely covered very clearly with all of us. He also this question came about the quality of the Chinese ship, which they delivered to Bangladesh and Pakistan. But I I I I firmly believe what Admiral said, I agree with you. What they export, nobody knows what they export be a ship or maybe a camera. But what they use is definitely better than what they export to others, to the Chinese quality and every aspect. Fishing militia, yes, they have made them very strong. And what Admiral said, so Indian Navy maintains that, and we also maintain that anybody coming nearby suspicious will be dealt with as a, as a threat to me, and they will be dealt that way. But yes, they are using them very nicely along with the Coast Guard. He maintains about the military philosophy. Yes, the maintenance loss is very good. We have seen the ship sustaining so long at sea, four to seven months. And they learned to use their offshore uh, bases of Djibouti, Cambodia, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. For Sri Lanka, they are not used so much, but there's a plan they had to sustain there. One point which he mentioned very clearly when it comes to Indian scenario, the Chinese Navy had not crossed the Malacca Strait till now as a formation. And the regions, he said very clearly. When to come to Indian Ocean, we have our own system. The first guard is your Andaman Islands. And then, of course, the Indian Ocean, Indian Navy is the regional Navy. It has all the potential, all the firepower, all the resources to take on. Number doesn't matter at times. It is the operational ability, combat training, it matters. Which I think US has age over them. So number may be less. It is 280 versus 400. But it is the Combat training, combat readiness matters. What remains of you, the Admiral, thank you so much for taking all the questions, elaborating the nice book presentation to us, and giving a lot of insight of US operations, how you do what you do with China, very openly and very frankly to all of us. I, on behalf of C3S, I'd like to thank you once again for being with us and presenting your views to us. Thank you so much. I also like to take opportunity to thank you all the participants here putting the nice questions which make the whole uh, this presentation more richer than the original presentation it adds so well <laughs> i like to thank my director general all the my my colleagues bala sandeep and uh, sapna who coordinated the whole effort to have this presentation 
and uh, thank you so much. I would like to see Admiral Mab. McDavid once more to come to us with some new presentation to us. We'll call you once again, sir. Well, yeah. that's fine. I just want to say thank I thank you. I've enjoyed this immensely. Um, the questions were terrific. Uh, and may, maybe if we sometime down the road be happy to do it. We don't need to talk about the book, just shoot questions. I'm <laughs> but in <laughs> any event, in any event, uh, it it's been a real pleasure and the quality of the questions and uh, are are terrific. Maybe one day in the future we could do something that uh, uh, explored explored uh, feedback reports that you're getting uh, from folks that are using Chinese equipment. So we have some insight into what's what is really going on inside the lifelines. With that, again, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, appreciate this very much. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Everyone, really wonderful having you with us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.